With the graduation season upon us, I was thinking about the young lives whose futures look bright and whose lives are full of passion and energy, ready to enter a new phase of their lives. They will go out and try to make a name for themselves, striving to be successful in all that they do. They want to make an impact in their generation and be remembered. But this is not only the hopes and dreams of young graduates. It is the desire of all of us at any age. We want to be successful and remembered. But what is it that you want to be remembered for? If you're younger and looking into the future, what do you want to be known for? If you're older and looking back at your life, what do you want to be said of you? How will you be described one year, five years, ten years, a hundred years, even a thousand years after your earthly life has ended? What will your earthly legacy look like? In the Apostle Paul's sermon at Antioch, recorded in Acts chapter 13, verse 22, he refers to a statement made by God concerning King David. From the time of King David to the Apostle Paul, it had been more than a thousand years. And yet this is how David is remembered by God and how God wants all of us to remember him. I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will do all my will. David, the son of Jesse, is remembered as a man after God's own heart. What a wonderful honor to be known as a man whose heart beats the very same as God's, who lived a life that really pleased the Lord, a man who loved God, a man after God's own heart. But we also remember that although he was one of Israel's greatest kings, he made some terrible mistakes in his life. King David was an adulterer and a murderer to name some of the darker moments of his life. How can such a broken and flawed man be known as a man after God's own heart? We have to remember this is not one man's opinion nor assessment of another man. This is Almighty God's assessment. The one who sees and knows all assess David, this flawed and broken man, as a man after God's own heart. What an honor. I'm sure that each of us want to be known as men and women, young men and young women after God's own heart. But to have this honor and distinction set of us, we need first to understand what God looks for when He examines and assesses each one of us. What is God's criteria when He sizes us up? What does God look for in a person? Let's take a look in the Bible for this answer. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 16 as we take a look at verses 1 to 13. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 1 to 13. Now as you turn to this passage, let me share with you something that happened to me a few years ago. I'd flown to Minneapolis, Minnesota to speak at a combined summer conference for a few churches. I didn't know them, and they didn't know me. They'd listened to some of my messages online, but back then we only had MP3 audio recordings, and they decided to invite me to speak at their summer conference. A few months before the conference, they asked me to send a short biography of myself along with a picture for their conference promotional materials. Having spoken at many conferences in North America, Europe, and Asia, I just sent the same bio and picture I always send to all those who request it. Praise the Lord, the conference was a spiritual success. The people were very engaged and responsive as I taught God's Word, and the Holy Spirit moved in their hearts. On the second day of the conference, at one of the meals, a lady, one of the pastor's wives, along with some from the planning committee, came up to me and told me something I've never been told in my many years of speaking at conferences. With all sincerity, she said, Pastor Stephen, can I give you some advice? I said, sure. She said, I think it's time for you to take a new picture of yourself because the headshot you emailed to the organizing committee doesn't really look like you. I thought it did because it was the same picture we had up in our church website back then. So I asked her, why the picture doesn't look like me. She said, because when the committee saw the picture, they collectively thought, oh no, he looks so serious and he looks so old. And they assumed through the picture that I must be one of those typical serious, intellectual Asian pastor preachers. In fact, they told me they thought about perhaps not inviting me to speak, but they'd already extended the invitation for me to come before they got the picture. 
They also told me it was harder to get people to come to the annual conference, unlike previous years, because of my picture, which was used in the promotional materials. Well, I asked them, now that you've met me in person and have heard me speak a few sessions, what do you think about me now? To my relief, they said, you look much younger than your picture, and you're always smiling, and you have a great sense of humor. That's why we wanted to tell you to have some new headshots taken. I told them, I thought churches wanted someone who looked older and wiser. I'm only 36 years old, and who's going to listen to a 36-year-old? They told me for the audience in North America, it's all about image, so please get some new pictures for the sake of your ministry. For this world, image is everything. That's why influencers have the followers they do, because everyone is trying to improve their image, their outward appearance. But instead of calling out those people as being shallow, we have to understand we do the same thing. We pass judgment, whether fairly or unfairly, on others just by their mere appearance and what we observe about how they act, what they wear, and how they talk. And realizing this is how people are assessed, we spend a lot of time making sure we have a good image. But when we place a high value on our image, it minimizes the value we place on character. And since we care too much about our outward image, we forget to cultivate an inward character. So is image important to God? What criteria does He use to size us up and assess our lives in order to be chosen to be used by Him in an impactful way? Look with me at verse 1. Now the Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, seeing I rejected him from reigning over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I'm sending you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I provided myself a king among his sons. Saul was the first king of united Israel. At his anointing and coronation, everyone thought that Saul would be the perfect king. He really looked the part. We are told in 1 Samuel chapter 9, verse 2, that he was an impressive young man. He looked good. The Bible describes him as a man without equal among all Israel, perhaps the most good-looking guy in all of Israel. He was described as being a head taller than anyone else, so he was the tallest man among all of his contemporaries. He was a warrior, a soldier, and had all the makings to be king. He was dignified and looked kingly. That's why all the people thought Saul would make a great king. But here we're told that God had rejected Saul as king because Saul didn't follow God. Now, he did at the beginning of his reign, but somehow Saul's heart turned against God, and he openly rebelled against God's specific instructions. So the prophet Samuel was told by God, to go anoint someone else to be the new king of Israel. He was instructed to go to one of the smallest and most insignificant towns in all of Israel, the little town of Bethlehem. Samuel goes to Bethlehem and meets Jesse and his family. I read now verse 5. And Samuel said to Jesse, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Here we're told the prophet Samuel approached the family of Jesse and asked him and his sons to be sanctified and consecrated because one of Jesse's sons would be anointed as the next king of Israel. You see, before this momentous occasion of the anointing, the candidates for the future king had to be consecrated before God. They had to be purified through the Old Testament animal sacrificial system because those in the service of the Lord had to be set apart cleansed and holy. So Jesse and the sons he called were all sanctified. Now Jesse brings his sons in a lineup before Samuel so that the prophet would choose which one of his sons would be the next king of Israel based on God's leading. Naturally, Jesse brings out his eldest first, his firstborn son Eliab, before Samuel. In the culture of that day, the firstborn son was thought of as the so-called best son and given all the birthright privileges that come with being the first in the birth order, given double portions and double blessings. Surely God would choose Jesse's firstborn Eliab, right? However, it's interesting to note that in the Scriptures, God does not necessarily always use firstborns to accomplish His will. Many times He chooses a secondborn or younger siblings to accomplish His purpose, whether it be Moses, Jacob, Joseph, Seth, 
Judah, and others. None of them were firstborns. Our birth order has no bearing on whom God chooses to accomplish His purpose. Look with me now at verse 6. So it was when they came that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. When Eliab was brought out, even the prophet Samuel, the great spiritual prophet Samuel, who was probably a good assessor of people, thought this one has to be the one. He was not only the firstborn, he looked the part. Why? We find out that Eliab was a man of strength and physical stature and presence. He looked dignified, even kingly. In fact, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 13, we see that Eliab is a soldier fighting in Saul's army against the Philistines and Goliath. He was probably a strapping young man, a warrior type, fit to be king. Samuel looked at the outward appearance of Eliab and thought, this must be God's chosen one, but he would be wrong because God does not assess us based on our looks nor on our reputation. This is our first biblical principle. God does not assess us based on our looks nor on our reputation. God does not assess us based on our looks nor on our reputation. You know, it's very natural to look at the outward appearance and make a judgment call on what's inside. Let's be honest. We are attracted to beautiful things. We wrongly assume if that something is beautiful on the outside, it must be beautiful on the inside as well. Just think about how we choose fruits to eat and to buy at the wet market or grocery store. We pick fruits generally based on if it looks good on the outside. If the fruit color is shiny and if there's no bruising on the skin, then we choose those fruits to buy and to eat. We rarely check on the taste or the inside of the fruit, if it's dry when it should be moist, if it's sour when it should be sweet. As long as the outside looks good, we're willing to buy it, assuming that the inside is also good. Fruit sellers know this. That's why they put wax on the apples to make it shiny. They put chemicals and preservatives to make sure that the fruit skin looks good, so that you will buy the fruits regardless of how it tastes inside. Outward physical attractiveness also comes into play when couples come together as life partners in marriage. When I used to do pre-interviews for weddings at our church, I would have the couple come to my office and I would ask them this question, what attracted you first to the other person? What attracted you first to your now fiancé? You know, it's interesting because the couple often thinks that when talking to a pastor, their answers must always be spiritual. And they will say things like, I was attracted to her first for her gentleness and sweet spirit. I was attracted to him first because of his leadership qualities. When they finished with their spiritual answer, the answer they thought I wanted to hear, I then asked them, come on, honestly, what first attracted you to the other person? And often with a sheepish smile, they would admit, I thought she was beautiful. I thought he was cute. You see, my friends, we assess things based on the outside packaging. And marketers know that we often buy things based on the packaging, and that's why the package looks so nice. Because we assume if it looks good on the outside, it must be good on the inside. But what the world thinks isn't how God chooses. That's why Saul was rejected, and so was Eliab, even though both look so good on the outside. God does not assess us based on our looks, nor on our reputation. And that's a wonderful truth of encouragement to those of us who don't think we fit the image of what the world defines as beauty or see ourselves as successful as defined by the world. God doesn't care about those things. God doesn't look at the outward appearance and the packaging. So if not the outward, then what does God look at to assess individuals? Look with me at verse 7. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Would you highlight, underline, and circle this verse? Note again what God says to Samuel. The Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. And this, my friends, is the very criteria that God uses to assess each one of us, young and old. He looks at our hearts. Samuel must have been surprised that God didn't choose Eliab. 
But he shouldn't have been knowing God's criteria. Only God can look into people's heart and make a true assessment of who they really are and what type of person they really are. It wasn't that God rejected Eliab from ever being used. It was that for the role of the next king of Israel, Eliab's candidacy was refused. My friends, it doesn't matter how intelligent, how beautiful, how popular, how studious, how fun-loving, how happy, how physically fit a person you are. God is looking at your heart to see if it's consecrated, teachable, responsive, passionate for Him. The world may be charmed by your beauty, intelligence, popularity, and success. But God is not impressed by those things. What God is looking at is your heart. How is your heart? You see, biblical principle number two is this. God assesses us based on what He sees in our hearts. God assesses us based on what He sees in our hearts. This truth serves two purposes. It can serve to encourage you, and it can serve to challenge you as an encouragement. Perhaps there are many of you who feel that God really can't use you because you're broken. You have a dysfunctional family. You're not eloquent. You don't look like the people you see on Instagram. You're not successful academically or professionally. You don't have many friends. But don't worry. God doesn't care about those things. The one criteria God is looking for in you to use you is your heart. As a challenge, it rebukes and reminds all who are naturally gifted and talented, who are blessed with great looks and are successful with lots of money. Those are not signs of God's approval of your life because God is looking at your heart. You may be able to fool others by creating an outward facade of your own greatness, but you cannot fool God. You know, it's easy to construct an image of your life so that others perceive you better than who you really are, even for a Christian. I know this firsthand because I used to be one of the best at this game. I could play the role of the perfect pastor's son. I could play the role of the perfect Christian. I knew all the right spiritual words to say at church. I knew how to dress and act like the perfect Christian. And I even had the Bible and theological knowledge to go along with it. I knew how to act and create a perfect facade where they would say, Stephen is the perfect prototypical Christian. In fact, my friends used to tell me how much they hated it when their parents would tell them, why can't you be more like Stephen? He's so respectful, goes to church every Sunday without having to be forced, is serving the Lord by singing in the choir. He's so involved in the youth group. Why can't you be more like him? And I'm not bragging and generalizing a bit, but this is true and can be corroborated by my mother. I was that young man that all the women in the church wanted their daughters to marry. I remember my name was used often, even though I had no idea how it was being used. For example, as long as I went to an occasion or attended a party, then as the pastor's son, the good Christian, it was okay for their children to go and attend as well. Sometimes it backfired on my friends because I remember one time, A woman at the church called our house to talk to my mother and was surprised to have me pick up the phone. The auntie was surprised that I was at home, so she asked me, aren't you supposed to be at so-and-so's party? I said, no, I've been here all day. But she replied, my son said that you were going. That's why I let him attend. I said, auntie, you better talk to your son when he comes back. That was the facade and the image that I cultivated all the way into my young adult years. But if you could peer into my heart as God could, you would see that the outward image didn't match my heart. For you see, my heart was a heart of rebellion. It was a heart that ran away from God. It was a heart that wanted nothing of God. It was a heart that didn't want God to be in control. It was a heart that was living a very worldly lifestyle. It was church on Sundays, but it was the world Mondays to Saturdays. No wonder the Lord could not use me. My friends, the Lord doesn't care about your reputation and image. He cares and looks at your heart. Have you examined your heart lately? What does your heart look like? You may have a great reputation to the outside world, perhaps as a CEO of a company, an award-winning artist or musician, a school administrator, someone well-respected in the community, the head of your family, an honor student, even a noted church leader. 
But what does your heart look like? Do you harbor sins, bitterness, and revenge? Do you justify sinful thoughts and actions in your life? Have you done unethical things for which you have made no amends? Have you put your heart against the standards in the Bible to see how it measures up or stands up? If God is looking at hearts, make sure you have cleansed, upright, and integrity-filled hearts. Now look at me at verse 8. So Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Well, if Eliab is disqualified, Jesse thought perhaps my secondborn Abinadab would be the one. We find out in the next chapter that Abinadab is also a fine-looking young man serving in Saul's army fighting against the Philistines. Outwardly, he was a man fit to be king, but God looked into his heart and did not choose Abinadab. Verse 9, Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. If not Eliab and Abinadab, then perhaps Shammah, the thirdborn, Jesse thought. Again, in the next chapter, we find out that Shammah was also fighting in Saul's army, a soldier, a warrior. This was a family, apparently, with really good genes. But God looked into his heart and didn't choose this one. Verse 10, Thus Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. Jesse let seven of his sons pass before Samuel for him to select one of them to be the next king of Israel. And while probably all of them qualified in the eyes of man, none of them qualified in the eyes of God, who sees in the hearts. Now, many of you know that God will choose David, but what I want you to notice is that the father, Jesse, doesn't even see or think David worthy to even be brought before Samuel. Jesse had already made an outward assessment of his son, David, and he said to himself, David doesn't look like king material. I'm sure Jesse loved David, but he was partial to his other sons. He showed favoritism and didn't even call David to the lineup. Perhaps some of you are in a situation where your parents have shown favoritism to your other siblings over you, and it eats you up, and it bothers you. It's not fair for sure, but then again, the world isn't fair. That is the reality we live in. The world, even family, favors those who look a certain way or acts in a certain manner. But the wonderful thing is that God isn't like that. Our comfort is in knowing that God doesn't show favoritism or partiality. He doesn't assess our lives based on favoritism. He loves all of us equally. He doesn't bless only those whom the world favors. But He looks into our hearts and chooses to show His blessings and grace by what our heart condition looks like. In fact, if you look at the Scriptures, we see that God often blesses more those who are the least regarded. Why? I believe it's because the least regarded are often the humblest people. And when someone who is humble does something great, God gets all the glory. God does not like to share His glory with another. And so if you have a proud heart, be warned, God cannot use you. The Bible tells us a proud heart will lead to our downfall. Even if you fake humility, God sees past it and looks at the true intent of your heart. That's why all seven of Jesse's sons in the initial lineup were not chosen by God to be anointed by Samuel to be the next king of Israel, even though they all looked the part, because God looked into their hearts and they were not the right fit. Now look at me at verses 11 and 12. And Samuel said to Jesse, Are all the young men here? Then he said, There remains yet the youngest. And there he is, keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. So he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, with bright eyes and good looking. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is the one. Samuel asked if Jesse had any more sons. And Jesse admitted there's still the youngest, David, but he was tending the sheep. While all the other brothers are in the lineup, he was left behind to faithfully do the task no one else had time for. When he was brought to Samuel, the Lord spoke to his prophet and said, This is the one. Anoint him as the next king of Israel. What did God see in the heart of David that he didn't see in the other brothers? I believe God saw in David a shepherd's heart, a heart that was wholly devoted to him, a heart that was humble and teachable, attuned to the things of God. 
You see, biblical principle number three, God is looking for a heart that is wholly devoted to Him. God is looking for a heart that is wholly devoted to Him. Here was the last child of an insignificant family living in an unimportant city in Israel, doing an unimpressive job. But God chose him to be the next king of Israel because David's heart was a heart for God. Now, we don't have time to explain the characteristics needed of a good shepherd, but I encourage you to read John chapter 10 and see how Jesus, the good shepherd, talks about the role of a shepherd, and you will have an amazing insight into what is a shepherd's heart. But I do want to give you a very quick glimpse of how David cultivated his heart through his years as a shepherd, through some of the Psalms David writes as he was a prolific poet. During his lonely years of shepherding, David had developed a heart for God, a heart wholly devoted for God. He learned to see God as his great shepherd. Remember, he wrote the beloved Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. David was saying, There is nothing else in my life I'm looking for. I'm fully satisfied in a relationship with the Lord because you, O God, are my shepherd. You're watching over me. You're caring for me. What else do I need? He had developed a heart wholly devoted for God. David sensed in his own care for his own sheep how he used to care for other people as exemplified by the great shepherd. That's what Israel needed. Israel needed a shepherd king. Living out in the open as a shepherd, bringing his sheep to graze, David would be exposed to the open elements. Now, most people would complain, I don't want to have that job. I want to have shelter when it rains. I want to have shelter when it gets cold. I want there to be shade when the sun comes out. But a shepherd had no choice but to be outdoors, exposed to the elements. However, through this experience, David sensed God's greatness through his creation. In Psalm chapter 19, verse 1, David wrote, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Here was a man whose heart was pricked whenever he saw God's work in nature. He saw in the night sky with all of the stars the majesty and the greatness of God. He would look at the storm clouds rolling in with the accompanying lightning and thunder show and probably simply exclaimed, Wow, God! Wow! Every day he walked out, his heart was declaring the praises and wonderment of God. That is a shepherd's heart, a heart focused on God. Those silent years, perhaps the weeks spent alone in the hills and valleys of Israel tending sheep, deepened this young man's sense of who God is, his greatness and his power. And what he saw and envisioned about God worked its way into his heart, and he lived it out. He saw the majesty of the voice that spoke through the thunder. So when he stood before Goliath, he looked at Goliath from the perspective of the Almighty God who speaks through the thunder and the storms, and he was not scared. And my friends, that's how we can stand before the giants of this world when our hearts are attuned with God's and our focus is solely on the all-powerful, loving, mighty God. That's why God selected David because he had cultivated a heart wholly devoted to him, cultivated in those years as a shepherd. David was good-looking, but he wasn't described as the warrior type of person. He was described as ruddy in color, perhaps a bit scrappy, you can say. He was bright-eyed, innocent, perhaps naive. So this innocent, scrappy shepherd would be the next king of Israel, chosen not for his physical appearance, but because of his heart, wholly devoted to God. My friends, do you have a heart that is wholly devoted to God? If not, would you cultivate one so that God can use you in a mighty way? This is the type of heart that God is looking for to bless and to use. The choice is ours in whom we give our hearts to. I pray it is given wholeheartedly in devotion and service of the Lord. Finally, look with me at verse 13. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel arose and went to Ramah. It would be many years before David is truly crowned king over all Israel. But why is he being anointed now? I believe Samuel is anointing David now as God instructed because God wanted David to continue guarding his heart 
and cultivating his shepherd's heart until such time he would rule over all Israel. David didn't need to change. He didn't need to manipulate the situation or do anything unethical to be successful. God was already going to make him great as long as he continued to have a heart that was wholly devoted to him. You see, David was chosen not because of anything he did or was going to do. He was chosen because of his heart. Men and women, young men and young women, you don't have to wait until the world accepts you. You don't have to wait until you're successful. You don't have to put up a facade or build an image just to get people to like you. Don't try to impress others, only to forget to impress the one we alone need to find accepting of us. God accepts and chooses us when our heart is right with Him. So guard your heart. If you have a heart for God, that's all you need to be blessed and approved by God. You know, I love how the anointing is described in verse 13. I wish I could paint or draw. Perhaps one of you can paint this scene one day. The Bible says David is anointed in the midst of his brothers. It is the idea of being encircled by his brothers, and he's in the middle. So imagine in your minds David's seven brothers, all very physically fit. Let's say they're six-foot-tall warriors. They are all surrounding a little shepherd boy looking down. He's their kid brother, and he's getting anointed as the next king of Israel. He will be king over them. Perhaps in your context, imagine seven graduating high school seniors all standing above a grade six student, looking and bowing their heads to him. That is the picture here. And perhaps the title of this painting or drawing is the crowning of a king, the crowning of a leader, the crowning of one God chooses. The world will look at this picture and say, there is something wrong with this picture. They are choosing a young boy who doesn't look as good as the others standing around him. Why choose him when there are so many others more eligible and more qualified? There is something wrong with this picture, the world will say. But my friends, there is nothing wrong with this picture. Verse 13 is a picture of God's selection process for the people He chooses to use. This is a picture of God's criteria for selection because there's something unseen with the human eye. There's something the painter cannot paint and the artist cannot draw. What is unseen is that this young man has a heart of gold, a heart of love and humility. He has a shepherd's heart, a heart consecrated for God. This cannot be drawn or seen, but this is why he's at the center. He has a heart for God. Now, I want you to notice a small but important detail. At the beginning of this chapter, when Samuel called Jesse's family and consecrated them and purified them, David wasn't there. David was in the fields tending to the sheep. So David didn't go through the purification ritual and process. Now, as he is being anointed as the next king of Israel, why did Samuel not consecrate him? Did you ever think about that? Why did David not go through the purification as prescribed in the Old Testament Scripture before he was to be anointed? In this momentous occasion, why was he not consecrated as his brothers had been? I believe it was because David's heart was already consecrated. He was already set apart. He was already ready to be used by God. You see, the process of consecration and sanctification is to get yourself ready. David didn't need to get himself ready. He was already ready, even in his young age. What about you? In your life right now, whether you're 12, 16, 18, 22, 30, 40, 50, 60 years old, are you ready at this moment to be used by God? If God were to look in your heart, what would He see? Have you been sanctified, consecrated? Are you holy? Do you have a shepherd's heart, a heart that is responsive, a heart that is receptive, a heart that is teachable? Do you have a heart wholly devoted to God? Remember, God does not assess us based on our looks nor on our reputation. God assesses us based on what He sees in our hearts. And God is looking for a heart that is wholly devoted to Him. May it be that we will all receive the greatest of honors when it can be said of us, this was a man, this was a woman after God's own heart. I hope it will be said of all of us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You for Your Word. 
What a wonderful reminder that we need to cultivate our hearts so that it is wholly devoted to you. Help us to not try to live to the pleasure of this world. We don't need to build up our image or reputation because you don't choose to use us based on those things. You look into our hearts, and I pray that our hearts are right with you. Lord, if there's any sin in our hearts, we confess them to the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that our hearts, all of our hearts, would be attuned to yours so that we can do as you so desire to live for your glory so that it can be said of us, this was a man, this was a woman, this was a young man, this was a young woman whose heart beats the same as God's. This is a person after God's own heart. Father, that's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.